Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneTouch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. By Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. And by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, Rachel Price admits she was in denial before she was diagnosed, insisting to her doctors there was nothing wrong. Now she's an advocate who stays positive but realistic. I just want one day where I don't have to think about carbs. One day when I don't have to worry about glucose levels. And he said, I know. He said, that's the thing is it never goes away. And I said, yep, it never goes away. And so it's okay to have those moments where you're just done. Rachel also started a shop called Diabetes. That's t-shirts and other products for sale with fun diabetes sayings and catchy slogans. She'll share her story. In our community connection this week, a senior thesis leads to a Nick Jonas parody. Meet Dan Haddon. Just like Mary Tyler Moore or Justice Sotomayor, there's Brad Michaels, Jay Cutler, Teresa May. Our medicine is the same, pancreas is our all aim, and Nikki, you know I gotta say, I'm diabetic like you. And tell me something good, a day camp milestone, and a hiker sets out to make his mark. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome back to another week of the show. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. Diabetes Connections is here to help educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection. We talk to athletes and artists and celebrities and healthcare company CEOs and tech folks that are pushing things along, as well as, quote, everyday people just living with type 1 diabetes. My son was diagnosed with type 1 just before he turned 2. He is now 14 and a half going into high school this fall. There is so much to tell you about, as usual. JDRF has the Children's Congress that they do in D.C. every other year. That's coming up next week. And I'm going to have the Charlotte area delegates on for that to talk about their upcoming experience and what they'd like to see happen. Of course, I'm in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And I've talked to delegates on and off really throughout the years. But this is the first time that I can remember we've had three teenagers from the area going to Children's Congress. And I only bring that up because while the little kids are, are cute and I know they make great pictures and it's wonderful for the parents you know, to have that opportunity, it's also really great to have the teenagers who are they are so articulate to share their story and they each have a different bit of advocacy, something that they want people to know. So I'm thrilled to share that with you. And then the week after that is Children with Diabetes Friends for Life, the biggest family diabetes conference likely in the world. And that is in Orlando every July. I'll be traveling there. We'll be taping some shows and making some announcements. And if you'd like to play in our game show, you do not have to travel to Orlando. I know not everybody can go to all of these conferences, but the game show is fun. You don't have to be there for the taping. If you are in Diabetes Connections, the group, that's the Facebook group, it is really easy to enter. There's a post. You can just comment on that. So please check that out. And we'll be drawing people at random. I think we're doing three, maybe four contestants this year. And that is in the Facebook group. The episode itself, uh, it's not going to be aired live. It will be aired in probably sometime in early August. So around here, we are very, very busy in the month of July. In addition to all of that, I've got some other offline projects that I'll be telling you about really soon. And my daughter is getting ready to go on a trip. She's working at a camp this summer, and then she's traveling, and then she goes to college. And Benny is getting ready to go to non-diabetes camp. We do that every year. He goes away for a month. Mostly, uh, it means that I am putting labels or stamps into all of his clothing. So we are working on that. Okay, let's get to the show. We're going to get to Rachel and her admittedly unusual diagnosis story in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And you know, when Benny was very little and in the bathtub or at the pool, I always noticed 
his fingertips. And you know what I mean, right? They were poked so much. They were just full of little pinprick holes that you could really see when they got wet. You know, we joked about it a little bit when he was younger, but it was kind of tough to see, to be honest with you. You know, he's 14. I don't see his hands that close up anymore. But we went to the beach recently. And I noticed that his fingertips, even when they're wet, they look totally normal. And we have been using the Dexcom for more than five and a half years. With every new iteration, we've done fewer and fewer finger sticks. And the latest generation, the Dexcom G6, eliminates finger sticks for calibration and diabetes treatment decisions. Just thinking about doing those 10 finger sticks a day we used to do in the past, easy, makes me so glad that Dexcom has helped us come so far. It's an incredible tool. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes diabetes treatment decisions. Learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. My guest this week has an unusual diagnosis story. We have heard from a lot of people over the years who are told mistakenly that they have type 2 diabetes. You know, it's not uncommon, especially among adults, because a lot of doctors don't know that adults can get type 1 diabetes, even though they've changed the name from juvenile diabetes. But Rachel admits she actually got in the way of her own type 1 diagnosis. And she's fine now. Rachel Price was diagnosed at age 25, more than 12 years ago. She has three children. She's got a thriving business, Diabetes. She makes t-shirts and other merchandise with catchy diabetes sayings on them. And she donates a lot of money back from the business to JDRF. She's also active in my local chapter. We are very fortunate to have a great adult type 1 group here in the Charlotte area. And she's a big part of that. Here's my interview with Rachel Price. Rachel, great to talk to you. We've been having conversations on Instagram and Twitter, and then I found out you were local to me, and it's great to have you on. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited. So you're just past uh, 12 years or 12 and a half years. You were diagnosed as a young adult, though. You were not diagnosed as a kid, right? Correct. I was 25, and it kind of hit me out of nowhere. You know, I'd been married for... Uh, about a year and a half, you know, and all of a sudden we've got this huge monster in the middle of our marriage, wow. which is kind of crazy. But the thing that's interesting about my story is that I had actually been having symptoms for almost two years before my diagnosis. Oh, wow. So it was a long time coming and I should have known better, but I, you know, chose to ignore it and chose to just say, like, for example, I went to my annual OBGYN visit and she said, you know, you've got a little glucose in your urine. And I'm like, okay, so what? You know? And then she was like, well, we probably should test you. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not doing that. So I was surprised your doctor didn't push. So you said, you said no. Yeah. I said, no, I'm fine. And then the next year I went back and she's like, you're really throwing a lot of glucose in your urine. And I was like, Okay, so what does that mean? She said, well, you may be developing diabetes. And I was like, meh, I don't think so. (laughs) But okay, and she's like, so you need to have a glucose tolerance test. So I was like, okay, well, I'll find somebody who will do this for me, right? So I I called around, I found a doctor who would do a glucose tolerance test for somebody that's not pregnant, right? Right. And they told me, you're going to have to come here. It's going to be three hours. You're going to have to have blood draws every 30 minutes or however often they did it. And I was like, "Eh, no, thank you. I'll pass. And so I said, no. So I didn't do anything about it. That's two years, right? right? Two times that somebody said, you need to get tested. And I said, no, I'm not doing it. So (laughs) honestly, like I only have myself to blame (laughs) for how bad it got before I was diagnosed because I was the one who kept saying, nope, I don't have diabetes. And I I refused. Let me ask you, though, how badly were you feeling? Because my guess is if you were feeling really sick and couldn't figure it out, would you still have turned down the glucose test? Okay, so what happened was about six months after that, I have a very severe allergies to cats. So mm. I was around a cat, I had a horrible reaction, and I had to go on prednisone to get my hives back under control. Immediately after that is when I started having symptoms, yeah. like serious symptoms. Like I couldn't wake up, I was sleeping constantly, I was going to the bathroom constantly. Like I knew every bathroom within a two mile radius of my house. Cause I couldn't even make it from the grocery store home without stopping. Like it was that bad. So, you know, I was, I was drinking a gallon of milk every two days. I was eating everything inside. 
and I was losing weight and I thought this is the best thing ever. What <laughs> I don't care what this is, but it's amazing. You know, like I was just exhausted. So I go to school cause I was a teacher at the time and I would teach, I would come home and I'd sleep for three hours and I'd get up, make dinner and then go back to bed. So that was my life. Like I couldn't do anything else other than eat, sleep and urinate. That's all I did oh, for like six months. And then my hair started falling out oh and that gosh. was it for me. Cause I'm like, I'm not going bald. I'm not going to go bald. So I said, okay, I got to go see what's going on because I'm losing all my hair. And it was, I'm telling you, falling out in clumps. Let me just jump in, Rachel, if I could. And, and for those of you listening who are, are wondering about the steroids, I, I think most of you probably know, steroids will make you incredibly insulin resistant. So as soon as Rachel started taking the steroids, the blood sugar went from however high it already was to right. off, off the charts, most likely. Off the charts. Oh, gosh. So you, So who did you call when, you know, now you've got your hair falling out? So then I called an, another doctor because I didn't even have a, a GP at this point. I was just going to Minute Clinic or wherever, you know, because I didn't have a physician. And so I called a local doctor and I said, hey, you know, something's up with me. I think it's my thyroid. My family has a history of thyroid problems. I want to come in and get checked. And so I went in, I took a day off of teaching, went to the doctor. I was feeling really, really, really good that day. Like I felt great. And he's like, yeah, I think it's probably your thyroid based on your symptoms. And I was like, yeah, I think so too. And so he did a blood draw and a urine test, I think. And then that was it. I went shopping, you know, ate whatever. Oh, and I remember that morning before I went to the doctor's office, I drank like a humongous glass of orange juice. Oh, humongous. Because I felt good and I was thirsty and, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So the next day I'm at school teaching and my cell phone rings and I see it's the doctor. And so I answer and it's the doctor himself. Wasn't a nurse. It was the doctor. And he says, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm teaching. I'm in the middle of my class. He's like, well, you need to come to our office as soon as like now. And I said, I'm not coming to your office right now. What's going on? And he's like, you remember how we said, well, it could be diabetes, but we didn't think it was. And I said, yeah. He said, well, it is diabetes. And I was like, okay, so what does that mean? He's like, you need insulin now. And I was like, well, I'm not getting insulin now. He said, Rachel, your blood sugar was 720 when you were in the office. And I said, well, okay, so what's it supposed to be? <laughs> right, right. What does that mean? <laughs> and he said, it should be under 120. And I was like, what? And then I was like, okay. And then it was like everything, you know how they say like everything goes in slow motion. Yeah. My world stopped. Like it just stopped turning. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what does this mean? Like my life is over. <sighs> Fortunately, there was another teacher in my science group that had had type one for like 30 years. So I went to her and I said, my doctor thinks I have diabetes. And she was like, you're going to be okay. And she like reassured me and everything. And so um, my husband was out of town. I was here alone. <laughs> so I go to the office after school and they're like, they tested me again. And he said, well, you're only at 350 now. And I was like, okay, so I'm good. <laughs> I'm cured. Like, no, you're not good. <laughs> <laughs> So then they gave me, um, they showed me how to inject insulin and they gave me some test strips and a meter and they set up an appointment the next day at the endocrinologist and they sent me home mm -hmm. with a brown paper bag with some syringes and some insulin and said, go to the endocrinologist tomorrow. That's it. That was my introduction. Did they indicate to you that it was type one? Did they even talk about that at all? You were not misdiagnosed with type two. Yes, okay. they said this is type one. Because I was like, well, can I just fix this with diet and exercise? They're right. like, oh, no, honey. No, no. Then, I, you know, I went home and uh, somehow I made it through the night. My mom drove down overnight to get there yeah. to be with me because I was literally alone shooting myself up with insulin for the first time in my life. So I don't know how I survived that first night, honestly. Wow. It's, it's just amazing to me as the parent of a, a kiddo who was diagnosed so teeny tiny. So everybody was so helpful to us and taught us and did everything. When I hear about adults and it can be when they say adults, you know, 18, 19 years old, you're an adult. Here's your stuff. Go home. There's so much less education. And it's it was nothing like I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I was supposed to eat. I didn't know how I was supposed to dose myself. I didn't know what no, normal numbers were. I mean, I remember waking up at like maybe two in the morning because I was sweaty. I was having a low, mm. but I didn't know what that was. So I just felt the survival instinct kicked in of you need to eat something now. Right. And so I did, but like, I had no clue. Like 
I was having a low in the middle of the night and I could have died. And I would not have, nobody would have known anything because I was left alone with a bag, a brown paper bag hmm. <laughs> of insulin. <laughs> the, the next day we went to the endocrinologist and they, they did an A1C and they said I was literally off the charts. They didn't even have, it wouldn't even register a number. It was so high. It was over 15. That's all they knew. Oh my gosh. When did you start to get educated then? So how did it progress from there? Right back to Rachel in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Have you ever tested your blood sugar with a meter and were unsure about the meaning of your result? Take the guesswork out of your numbers with the One Touch Vario Flex meter. It uses color short technology to instantly show you when your or your loved one's blood sugar numbers are low, indicated by blue, in range, green, or high, red. So you can quickly get on with your life. You can also use the meter's built-in Bluetooth smart technology to seamlessly sync with the OneTouch Reveal mobile app, available now as a free download for Android devices on Google Play and Apple devices in the App Store. OneTouch, because taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. Now back to Rachel talking about how she started to learn to live with type 1. Well, then, you know, the minute that my uh, mom arrived and we went to the endo, I was like, okay, this is my life. I've got to own it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I dove in head first. um, And my mom did too. And we just really first week, she stayed for about a week and we just, you know, figured it out. And um, I met with a dietitian, I think, and they told me how to carb count and all this stuff. And, and so it was, it was a baptism by fire, if you will, but it worked out. And it was funny because (laughs) I took the, the day off for the doctor, went back to teach the next day. Then the following day I took off because I had to go to the endocrinologist. And then the following day I was back at school again. Wow. So I literally took one day off after getting diagnosed with diabetes and I was back in the classroom. I mean, I mean now I look at that and I'm like, what was I thinking? Oh. <laughs> what do you teach? What grade? And do you still teach the same grade? I'm certified 612 science. But um, right now I teach at a private school and I teach everywhere from second grade up through eighth grade. Got it. So on all different subjects. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to rush through the story here, but I'm, I'm trying to reconcile this incredible diagnosis of really walking around with this for so long, getting diagnosed. And then you have three children now. I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's like you kind of said, all right, I'm going to I'm going to take this on. And life goes on. How old are your kids? Almost 10, almost seven, and just turned two. Wow, you're busy. Yes. And I have, a, I have an exchange student this year who is a senior in high school as oh, well. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> Where are they from? She's from Spain, yes. Cool. So when you and your husband decided that you wanted to start a family, obviously diabetes was a big part of, of learning and, and doing. Were you frightened about that? Were you educated? Tell me about that. <sighs> okay, so I tend to fight fear with knowledge. So anytime I'm nervous about something, I just read voraciously about it until I can understand it. And I feel like, okay, there's nothing to be afraid of here. My husband says that's because I'm a control freak and I can't stand (laughs) to not know what to do in a situation. So anyways, I did a lot of reading. I tried to prepare myself for what I was going to encounter as a type one patient, right? Because, because that's the thing, like I wanted to have a natural birth. I wanted to have a normal pregnancy as normal as possible. And so I just spent a lot of time reading even scientific articles about pregnancy and type one and blood sugar levels and what are the impacts on the child. So like the first time I went in and had an ultrasound, I said, okay, I know these are the possible problems that we could have, right? And I listed them off and they just looked at me like, what? Because I knew all of the stuff, right? (laughs) And so, you know, having that knowledge really does help you as a type one patient, because the doctors look at you differently, right? They look at you as, okay, this person knows what they're talking about. They have educated themselves and we can, you know, they have good control. We can kind of step back a little bit. It gives you a lot more leniency in terms of what you want for your pregnancy, if that makes sense. Yes. I had very supportive doctors because of the fact that I advocated for myself constantly. And so with my first birth, um, she actually came on her own. I was scheduled to be induced, but she decided she was going to come five hours before her induction time. So she came on her own. So she was full term, you know, which is 
kind of unheard of for that to happen, but I worked really hard to make that happen. Um, with my second one and my third one, I was induced around 39 weeks, I think, with both of them. So I made it, you know, the whole time and the doctors were really supportive and I just stood up for myself. Like there were things that they have in their little book on pregnancy and diabetes that are the procedures that they follow, right? Which right. sometimes make sense and sometimes they don't make sense. And so for me, there were a lot of times where I said, listen, you can't throw this blanket treatment plan over me. I'm not like that, right? I'm very well controlled. Right now, my A1C is that of a normal person without diabetes. There's no sign of any problem with the child. And then they say, you know what? You're right. We don't have to do NSTs twice a week. We can do once a week. And I said, thank you, because I wasn't coming anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> You're still saying no to the doctors. That hasn't changed. Yeah. I mean, like, I would say, listen, you proved to me that I need this done and we'll do it. And they, when they couldn't, then they backed off because there were a lot of things that they want to intervene constantly. And I said, you don't need to intervene. We're doing fine. It really is just about advocating for yourself and educating yourself. And then you can have a pregnancy that's perfectly normal. My children, none of them ended up in the NICU, which, you know, sometimes that's because of diabetes. Sometimes it's not, right? right. But we were very fortunate. None of them ended up in the NICU. I had normal deliveries. We went home normal time. They, they were large, but they weren't humongous. My biggest was 912, which is kind of big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my endocrinologist said, you might have just had big babies anyways. You know, who knows? So during your pregnancies, and it's been, you know, your oldest is almost 10, as you said, I'm just curious, did you use CGM at that time? Because they, that was pretty new 10 years ago. Right. So I did not. My first two, I just did finger sticks like every two hours almost. Yeah. Wow. I was testing constantly. But my third one, I did have a CGM. And that was a game changer for sure. Do you mind if I ask what kind of tech you use, if you use anything now? Oh, no, of course. Yes, I am a huge proponent of the Omnipod. I've mm -hmm. been on the Omnipod for over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I also use the Dexcom. I had the G4, and then I just updated to the G6 a few months ago. And that's been a – I was shocked at the difference in the technology between the G4 and the G6. It's really amazing. So you went from these, these three pregnancies, and I know there's more concerns about that, but then being a mom with type 1, raising three mm -hmm. little kids, to me, that's got to be one of the most difficult things because as a mom without type 1, I always felt like I was running behind. You know, everything was never right. finished. I never had any time, especially when they were little. It's a lot different now that they're teenagers. But, you know, eating was crazy, you know, and sleeping was crazy. I don't want to say how did you do it because, you know, you just do it. But any advice for other moms that are just beginning their journey with little kids? Well, I would say one of the things that I did um, with my oldest that really I do encourage all T1D moms to do, and that is to teach them how to bring you candy at a very young age. That is important because there were times when I couldn't get it. And I'd tell her, go get mommy some candy. And she would run and do it and bring it to me. And, you know, she saved me several times. <laughs> yeah. because of that. So that is one thing I say, definitely train at least one of your children to do from very young. I mean, from the time they can walk, you know, they should be able to, to go get you something and bring it to you. And I have never tried to hide my diabetes from them. I have tried to explain everything to them. So they, they know this is my normal and they know not to be afraid when I have a bad low, you know, they've seen that they've seen me go through it and it worries them, but they know she's going to be okay. This is just part of diabetes, right? I think, honestly, like the kids understand better than a lot of adults do, if mm. that makes sense. No, I, <laughs> they get it. I hear you on that. So tell me about diabetes. When did this start? How did you get into the T-shirt business? And this is, you know, uh, we'll link it up, uh, you know, with the show notes and at diabetes-connections.com. Fun teas for raising diabetes awareness. And they really are fun. How did you get started? Well, I was sitting at a coffee shop with one of my friends, and we were just talking about some entrepreneurial ideas we had and, you know, just things that we'd like to do sometime in our life. And I said, you know, I've got these ideas for really fun diabetes t-shirts. And she said, well, why aren't you doing anything with it? I was like, I 
can't. No, I don't know anything about that. I don't know how to start a business. I don't know how to design t-shirts or sell them or make them or whatever. She's like, it's not that hard. Just do it. And I was like, okay. So I went home that night (laughs) from the coffee shop and I was like, hmm, I can do this. And I started right then and I got a few ideas and put them on, on shirts. And then I just started, uh, got a website and just jumped in. And so I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur really, but I guess I kind of am. (laughs) (laughs) It's been a really fun journey. It's been really fun. So let me ask you some dumb questions about this business because I see, you know, we all see there's a few different, you know, businesses out there, mostly people with type one or who have ties to the diabetes community making these great shirts. How hard is it not to copy from each other? I was kind of wondering at first, like, hmm, how's this going to work? Because You know, sometimes we have similar ideas, but they're different or whatever. And we are all very supportive of each other. Like, it's amazing. So, like, sometimes somebody will reach out to me and say, hey, Rachel, do you have any shirts that say this or that? And I'll say no. And they're saying, well, because I was going to make one, but I didn't want to copy anything you had. And, you know, we kind of just, I go and check and see, does anybody else have this, you know, before I create it? And so we just kind of respect each other and we, Mm. we stick up for each other. And a good example for that is just the other day, one of my friends, like we've never met in person, but we're Instagram, you know, diabetes. Oh yeah, you're friends. And uh, yeah, we're friends. And she texted me and said, Hey, I saw one of your designs on this copycat site and it's not even a legitimate site. You know, it's somebody in Vietnam or something. Uh, And I said, what? And so she sent me pictures and then we were texting back and forth and she was like, I found one of mine on that site. And so we were like texting each other back and forth saying, I got it taken down. And she's like, yeah, I got it taken down. You know, like we we look out for each other. And when we see something out there that's, you know, a copyright infringement, we will tell the other person like, hey, I saw your design over here. Somebody's copying it, you know? Yeah. Because most of the time it's not anybody that's in the diabetes community that's doing it. It's someone outside who's trying to capitalize on our disease, which we have a big problem with, right? Because they're not really trying to support us. They're trying to make a buck. And it's not the same thing as those of us who are in the community trying to spread awareness, trying to build a positive image of people with diabetes. And so we really do stick together and we have each other's back. It's been really good. But yeah, I'm really careful about not copying somebody else's design. And if somebody else has something similar that somebody wants, like I have a lot of people that come to me and say, Hey, Rachel, can you put this on a shirt? And I'll say, well, I could, but somebody else already has that. So why don't you go over there and get it from them? You know, I try to do that as much as possible so that, you know, we are respecting each other's creativity. You mentioned right at the beginning when we were talking about your diagnosis story that you had somebody at school that you could go to and say, what am I going to do? And, you know, they she kind of put your mind at ease. And now you've got this group of people here. Do you think that those first couple of weeks or even months might have been different without that teacher? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt. I I even with her there, I I was so I don't want to say ashamed, Hmm. but I just was kind of in shock. And I was dismayed and I felt alone. And, you know, that's one thing that I've talked a lot about is that this disease is very lonely. It is a very lonely disease because you are battling it by yourself, you know, every minute of the day and nobody else. Well, now with, with the Dexcom follow, my husband knows where I am at all times, you know, (laughs) as far as glucose level, but for years, you know, nobody else knew where I was at any given moment. They didn't know I was having a low on the bathroom floor and I was trying to crawl to find some candy. You know, like I was alone with this disease and I still am in a lot of ways, but having other people that you could at least ask a question to or talk to or say, Hey, like one day I remember very distinctly my pump, my pump uh, at the time I was on a tubed pump and it, it failed somehow. And I ran to her and she was using the same pump and she said, don't worry, don't worry. I have another infusion set. We'll get Mm -hmm. you set up. Like that was a huge blessing to me. And, you know, if I didn't have that, I don't know what I would have done. Honestly, I did pass out once at school while teaching shortly after I was diagnosed and, you know, she was there and saying, you're going to be okay. You're going to get through this. You know, like it's okay. They didn't have to call the squad. I came back up on my own. Um, My students were like, literally holding me. Oh in their my arms. gosh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because I just collapsed, you know, and um, so they were holding me and it was a very, um, 
embarrassing <laughs> time, but you know, she was there to help. And that was so important to me. And we, we still keep in touch actually, even though she's moved on to something else. And so have I, but you need people, you need your tribe. You desperately need your tribe. And I didn't realize that for a long time, how much I needed other people just to, to support me. If you're struggling or alone, you feel alone, or you're just really down on yourself about having diabetes, we have all been there. I was just there the other night, standing in the bathroom, just crying. And my husband says, what's going on? I said, I'm just tired of having this disease. I just want one day where I don't have to think about carbs. You know, one day when I don't have to worry about glucose levels. And he said, I know. He said, that's the thing is it never goes away. And I said, yep, it never goes away. And so it's okay to have those moments where you're just done. You know, you're just done with diabetes. But find somebody that you can say that to. Find someone who will understand where you are and they will help you come back up and see that, you know, there is still a lot of joy to be had, even with this disease. And if that's me, message me. Message me on Facebook. Message me on Instagram. Send me a message through Etsy, however, because that's what I love to do. I love to encourage people and say, you know what, you can do this, and I'll, I'm here for you. That's really what diabetes is all about. It's about raising awareness, making our disease visible, because it's normally very, very invisible, right? You no, know, Most people don't even know I have it if they see me, you know, on the street. So it's there to encourage us. It's there to raise awareness. And most of all, it's there to help fund a cure. And so if you're feeling like you're alone or lonely or just need someone to listen, please feel free to reach out to me anytime because I love to encourage people. That's what the business is all about. And that's why most of the t-shirts are really funny. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Rachel, thank you so much. Well, I am so honored that you asked me. I'm just thrilled. (laughs) You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Of course, I will link up to Rachel's store and her Facebook page at diabetes-connections.com. And in the show notes, uh, you know that I have show notes for every episode. You can go to the website or if you're listening in a podcast app, they're all a little bit different, but they all have a little details or more here. And if you're listening in a podcast app, I would love it as well if you would take a minute to rate and review the show if you like it, if you don't like it. I can't believe you're listening this far in, but who knows? But if you like the show, definitely rate and review and make sure you are subscribed. It is free to subscribe on any podcast app. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button and that'll make sure the show gets delivered to you every week, no matter which app you are using to listen. I've talked to a lot of technical people recently, a lot of experts and, uh, you know, healthcare CEO types. And it was really great to talk to Rachel. I need to every once in a while to, you know, to get those real life diabetes stories. So I really appreciate her coming on. Our community connection this week started when I could not stop watching a YouTube video. I love this one. Community Connection is brought to you by Tandem, and you've heard me rave about the T-Slim X2 insulin pump with basal IQ technology from Tandem Diabetes Care, and we are not alone. The results of a 2018 clinical study known as the Prologue Trial showed 91% of study participants said the basal IQ feature on the T-Slim X2 pump was easy to use. We agree. We are thrilled with it. Benny loves that it looks modern, not like the clunky brick he used to use. I love that he finds it so easy. Find out more about Benny's pump at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Tandem logo. I was clicking around on Instagram, I want to say, and I saw a link to this video. And I don't always click over, right? I mean, we see a lot of silly videos. There's a lot of fun stuff out there, but I don't know. I don't always head on over to YouTube. My kids watch it like it's television. They don't see the difference. It's amazing to me that YouTube is really their main source of screen. What do you call it? TV, Netflix, that kind of thing. God, I sound so old. But anyway, I clicked over and I could not stop watching. Before I play a little bit of this for you, let me tell you about Dan Haddon. I was going to have him on the show and I will later on, but it turns out he is leaving for Teach for America. So by the time I found him, the timing was terrible. It it just didn't work out. So I, I asked him to email me a couple of answers to some questions I asked him. And he said he made the YouTube channel 
for his senior project. There was a thesis requirement at his school, and he chose to research YouTubers, specifically YouTubers with disabilities, and the rise of one star in particular, Molly Burke. Apparently, Molly is a blind vlogger who helps educate people on common misconceptions about the blind community. And he goes on to say, I thought I could make content like that for diabetics. Ultimately, I want to show the world what diabetes looks like, particularly the misconceptions versus the realities. And I wanted to make content specifically for diabetics as well. Little inside jokes for the community. And let me tell you, he has absolutely done that. Here's a clip of Dan's video. It's Diabetic Sucker Parody, which he says is specifically for Nick Jonas. And of course, it's a parody of the Jonas Brothers Sucker. Just like Mary Tyler Moore or Justice Sotomayor, there's Brad Michaels, Jay Cutler, Teresa May. Our medicine is the same, pancreas is our all aim, and Nikki, you know I gotta say, I'm diabetic like you. So can I join the Jonas Brother family? I'm diabetic like you. How great is that? He's got a few other videos. And he says, once things die down with the Teach for America training, I hope to make more parodies and continue to spread my message. I asked him why Teach for America. He said, because a lot of my peers were graduating college and getting jobs they were unhappy in, unpaid internships, they were remaining unemployed. I knew I wouldn't enjoy working for a company that only focused on profit. Becoming a teacher just made sense. A stable job where your goal is to educate children and ultimately make society better. The more we invest in children, the better our society will be in the future. Parentheses, aka we might get the cure to diabetes faster. I really hope to bring you more of Dan in the future and hopefully we can chat, but I will be on the lookout for his videos and I will link up this one specifically in the show notes. Here's a little bit more. I'm diabetic like you. Time now for Tell Me Something Good, my favorite part of the show. Tell Me Something Good is brought to you by Real Good Foods. Have you been to their website yet? I mean, it's great to go there to order. They have the most variety, of course, on the website. But I love the store finder that they have there as well, because that makes it really easy to find everything from their crispy cauliflower crust pizzas to their poppers, to their breakfast sandwiches, the new Italian line. If it's in the grocery store, it's just so easy to go and grab it and bring it home. Low carb, high protein, you know, real food, no weird sounding words on the ingredient labels, no processed grains or fillers. The family size cauliflower pizza crust is made from cauliflower, eggs, and cheese. That's it. And all of their foods are grain-free, gluten-free, and use all natural ingredients. I'm really happy that we found Real Good Foods. I'm thrilled they're a podcast partner, but the food is great. Whether you pop it into the toaster oven like I do, or you put it in the frying pan like my husband and Benny prefer, and I've been told I got to get an air fryer now. So we're going to go get that later this summer. I'll report back. We'll check it out. Find out more about Real Good Foods. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on their logo. Our first Tell Me Something Good story comes from Inspired by Isabella. Now, you may remember this family. We've had Greg and Christina Dooley, Isabella's parents, on the podcast before. Isabella is a triplet, her brother Max, her sister Mia. And uh, Isabella, or Isa, as they call her, was diagnosed with type 1 when she was two years old. She's going to third grade this year. And this summer, they hit a big milestone in their T1D journey. Isa has been doing gymnastics for a long time now, and they decided to send her to a gymnastics camp. Now, this is a day camp, but the days Christina shared were 11 hours long. She says the most hours Isa has ever had to manage her type 1 care without us. Hesitantly, we agreed and signed her up. While the last few days weren't completely free of issues, we can 100% say this experience was great. 
During pickup at the end of camp today, I tried to hold back tears while telling the trainer how much their care meant to us this week. I received unprompted updates from the trainers and calls letting me know they were handling the many lows she experienced because of increased activity levels. The best part was how proud Isa was that she rocked this week mastered new skills and proved she can really do anything with this disease. Most importantly, we have to give her the opportunity to do just that. So that is great news. You know, I'm a big fan of any kind of camp. Christina explained to me that they had talked to the trainers about what to expect. They've known each other for a long time. So there was a lot of prep work, of course, that goes into something like this. But way to go. That is such a great story. I am thrilled to hear it. Got a great note in the podcast group from Cammie, who says, my son is going away to college in the fall. We are both excited. No CGM. He's rocking a 6.2 A1C. We are ready as far as diabetes goes. But don't ask about mama's empty nest phobias. Ha ha ha. She writes, Cammie, thanks for that. And Mike Joyce. Wow. Mike writes in, I'm starting a through hike of the Appalachian Trail July 10th. And he linked up a blog post about how he's managing diabetes while hiking. I think I'm going to try to talk to Mike either, well, when he's off the trail, but maybe we'll see if he can record some stuff while he's on it. And he says he's going to be blogging about it as well. But Mike has prepared in some interesting ways. He's decided to use Afreza, the inhalable insulin. He's also using Eversense, the implantable CGM, because as he says, you know, it's one less thing to worry about on the trail, not having to change sensors or worrying about them falling off, that sort of thing. He also talks about his diet on this journey, and this blew my mind. So resourceful and unusual. Over the last few months, he writes, I've developed a variety of mail drops with self-made freeze-dried meals. Although I love honey buns, the impact they have on my blood sugar is not something I'm choosing to take on during the hike. My meal planning is an entire post in itself and will soon follow. I'm going to link up Mike's Instagram, which is how he will be keeping people posted. I wish him all the best. That is a big deal whether you have diabetes or not. So Mike, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Do you have something for Tell Me Something Good? You can always post in the Facebook group. That post is usually pretty easy to find with a big smiley face and it says, Tell Me Something Good. Or you can email me, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com or just reach out on any of the social channels and tell me something good. Counting down the days to Friends for Life because in addition to the talks I'm giving, I'm doing the Wait, Wait, Don't Poke Me the diabetes game show that I've done before, which is always so much fun. And we'll be playing that as an episode, probably in early August. We'll definitely be sharing that with you. It's just a question of exactly when. It just depends on the timing. I'm doing a session called The World's Worst Diabetes Mom, which I debuted at the Touched by Type 1 conference. And that is all about the struggle for perfection I'm seeing in so many parenting Facebook groups and how it's just not a part of my parenting playbook. I'm far from perfect and how that's okay and how we really have to embrace that. So that's another session I'm doing. I'm doing the closing keynote with Maura McCarthy about taking home Friends for Life, about taking it with you, everything you've learned, all the things that you can get at a conference like this. So if you're at Friends for Life, please come see us at those sessions. But I'm also going to be making a big announcement about the rest of the year plans around here. And I will definitely be bringing that to you as well. I'm so excited about something I've been working on behind the scenes. It is not a podcast, although it is kind of podcast related, I guess. So make sure you're signed up for the newsletter or you're in the Facebook group. That is the way to go. That's how I'll be reaching out and really telling you about this new project. Can't wait. All right. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. And thank you so much for listening and for making this show really, you know, something that I'm able to do now for four years and 236 episodes. Thank you for sharing the show, for chiming in on social media, for telling me more of what you want to hear and just being part of it. I really appreciate it. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.